Okay, so Kate, it's telling me that it can't record. Um, hold on. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that. There's always a, a uh, technology glitch, isn't there? Okay, can you see the full screen? Yes. Okay, good, good. Thank you so much, Kate, for that introduction. And, um, and thanks, really, for asking me to, to talk tonight. Um, I really love to talk to groups like you and, um, and just share what fire looks like in the South Carolina mountains. So I'm going to hit on those topics some, the past, present, and future of fire in our, in our mountains in this state of ours. I'm going to hit first on controlled fire in the South Carolina mountains, uh, why we burn. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pinnacle Mountain Fire because when we talk about fires in the in the mountains of South Carolina, um, our minds go to the Pinnacle Mountain Fire that burned in 2016 at Table Rock. I'm going to hit a minute on the consortium of Appalachian fire managers and scientists and then a few minutes on the Fire Tigers program. So I'm going to jump right in and uh, let's take a look at the past. So here you'll see I've got three slides here, past, present, and future, and each slide has our land management partners listed. Uh, the upstate of South Carolina is, has a, is very active in partner work. In the past, the U.S. Forest Service Sumter National Forest, uh, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, Jocassee Gorges, the South Carolina Forestry Commission, South Carolina State Parks, and Greenville Water. So, these are the partners that really are at the table and are active in using fire to manage lands in the mountains. The Sumter National Forest has in the past, for the past 35, almost 40 years really, um, had active controlled burns on their lands at an average in the past of about 5,000 acres per year. Uh, Joe County Gorges has about 10 plus years of controlled burns with an average of about 500 acres per year. The South Carolina Forestry Commission, Commission is very limited in their burns and they're on private and state lands and you don't see the commission burn, doing as much burning in the mountains in the past. South Carolina State Parks in the past had no history of control burns and then our um, Greenville water lands in the mountains of South Carolina had no, no history of controlled burning. So let's take a look where we sit presently. Uh, pres by presently, I mean in the last 12 months, what prescribed fire has looked like in our mountains here. Uh, the Forest Service is now up to about 7,000 acres per year. That's the most ever. Uh, when I say Forest Service, that's the Sumter National Forest. So the Stump House Ranger, the Andrew Pickens Ranger District, the Stump House Ranger Station over uh, north of Wahala, the, uh, the Chattooga River area. Um, South Carolina DNR really is holding steady with their burn programs at about 500 acres per year. Mark Hall does a great job of managing Joe Cassie Gorges, but he ha only has a staff of three or four. And those guys do a tremendous amount of work to get ready and they just have capacity issues. You can only burn so much land with a short and small staff that he's got. So um, he continues to maintain good um, good burning, but sticking with that four, 500 acres per year. The South Carolina Forestry Commission now is, continues to be limited on private lands, but they have this renewed commitment to help do controlled burns on South Carolina State Parks in our mountains. Uh, we've worked very hard for the about, gosh, probably the last 12 to 15 years to put more fire in our South Carolina State Parks in the mountains. There have been active pro burn programs in South Carolina parks in the Midlands and to the coastal plain, but not in the mountain region. And that was due to just mostly capacity issues. They just didn't have the expertise to do it. So now through our approach to prescribed fire in the mountains where we partner very closely and we, we share ideas, we share staff, we share a lot of things to get uh, these burns done. The state parks really has taken off in the last three years. Their first burn was in 2018 and they've done additional burns in 2019 and 2020 with the help in some cases of the South Carolina Forestry Commission, uh, some cases help from the Nature Conservancy excuse me, the Nature Conservancy as well. 
The first burn that was done in 2018 was at Oconee, adjacent to Oconee, or Oconee State Park land adjacent to U.S. Forest Service land. Because of that, we were able to do what we call a widen agreement, where we can burn Forest Service land combined with state park land, and they didn't have to pay anything to do it. Our staff showed up and did the burning for them. So it was really a win-win situation, and it went over great. And so that year, in 2018, we also were able to burn some, some acreage at Table Rock, and that was burned by the Forestry Commission and um, and the Nature Conservancy. And then last year in 2019, or actually this year in 2020, earlier this year before COVID hit, we were able to burn about 250 acre, acres at Devil's Fork State Park. And that also was, uh, actually the park land was less than 250, but combined with US Forest Service land again, it was a 250 acre burn. So these situations where we can partner are really win-win for our lands who need to that need to see fire on the ground. And then Greenville Water, we celebrate big. They had their first burn of about 130 acres this year. So what does the future look like? Um, are we happy with, do we feel like we're burning um, enough of these ecosystems that need to be restored? What does the future look like? The Forest Service continues to grow their program. They hope to, to hit maybe 12,000 acres per year, give or take. It depends on the year and what is available to burn. Um, South Carolina DNR would like to do more burning, but like I've already mentioned, uh, staffing issues really, really hold them back. Uh, the commission will continue doing partnership burns with like its South Carolina state parks and landowner programs. Uh, the state parks really um, are diving into more controlled burns at Kiwi Toxaway and additional burns at Table Rock State Park. And then Greenville Water is continuing to develop new burn units and they're also developing a wildfire response plan. And so I'll talk a little bit about our involvement with wildfire and the Pinnacle Mountain Fire at Table Rock and how all these partners were at the table in a wildfire setting too. So why do, you, why do we all connect like this, all these different agencies and how do we do it? Well, we are fortunate enough to be about 14 years into a program that's administered by the Nature Conservancy called the FLN, the Fire Learning Network. And the Fire Learning Network is partnered with the Consortium of Appalachian Fire Managers and Scientists. And our goal is to bring all those fire practitioners and all those fire scientists in the Southern Blue Ridge together so that we can share ideas, we can share science, we can sh share management strategies, we can share cool plants that come up in burn units that, um, that we're excited about. We can share all kinds of things. Uh, we can share staff, uh, like I've given the example here today where we've been able to do larger burns through sharing of staff and equipment. And so really, it, I liken it to we're one big happy family now, and it's been 13 years of building this, um, this really great network where we all work together for the better of our lands in the Southern Blue Ridge and, um, and the South Carolina mountains. So why do we burn? Um, you know, three main reasons for ecological restoration uh, the benefits to wildlife, and as well as fuels management or structure protection. So I'm going to kick it off and talk a little bit about ecological restoration first. And when I talk about ecological restoration, sometimes people don't understand that our ecosystems are a bit out of whack. Um, we have done, the Forest Service and Smokey here has done a really good job of putting out fires for the last hundred years. Um, we now know that we should have been letting some of these fires burn where they could burn safely without threat to structure and life. Uh, ecosystems need fire and um, without fire what we've seen nationwide is this accumulation of fuel over um, many, many years, 100 years, and it leads to that, along with other things like climate change, lead to these catastrophic fires that we see every summer, that we, uh, that we just saw this summer, one of the biggest summers of catastrophic fire on record. So, you know, I say all this to say that Smokey has his place, that uh, wildfire, we should be preventing wildfires. Um, 
but we should also be letting fires burn where they where they where they naturally should should be so so we have this this challenge now to to use fire in a controlled way to restore these ecosystems that we've lost um, so what does that look like in our South Carolina mountains? It looks different no matter where you are in the country. Um, but here in the South Carolina mountains, I'm going to hit on a few uh, ecosystems that we work hard, we're working hard to restore. Our Table, our table Mountain Pitch Pine communities um, is the first one I want to hit on. We've been doing Table Mountain Pine Pitch Pine research in the South Carolina mountains for almost 25 years now. Um, this is a fire dependent species. Table Mountain Pine has a serotonous cone, so we need fire to open that cone. And then our pitch pine is not serotonous in the southern end of its range here in the southern Blue Ridge, but in the northern end of its range in the New Jersey Pine Barrens and uh, Massachusetts area, it is, it does have a serotonous cone and needs, it needs fire to propagate. Um, so we started off, you know, knowing that we needed fire to regenerate and we also started off this research knowing that Table Mountain Pine was in serious decline. Uh, it grows on south facing very rocky ridge tops, uh, no value for timber. I call it a short squatty pine. It just kind of hangs on to those really steep ridge tops and holds it all together. It's my favorite tree. When I started with the Forest Service day one, this is the tree I worked on with my research. And so um, it's been really fun to follow it over the years and watch, um, watch our knowledge develop as we have been able to do controlled burns in these ecosystems. So not only do we need fire here in this ecosystem to open these cones, but we need fire to prepare our seed bed. Without fire, we have this massive accumulation of duff on our forest floors that isn't um, isn't necessarily good in all cases. And without fire to reduce that duff on the forest floor, these seeds in Table Mountain Pine can't germinate. They just simply can't get roots through anything more than about three inches and be successful. So that, um, that reduction in forest floor as well as the increase in sunlight to the forest floor are really key things that lead to success with this species. We have a lot of great places now that we've burned that we have um, really great regeneration of the species. And, and now we're thinking about how do we go in and burn these younger stands so that we can begin to develop these uneven age stands, which naturally would have occurred across the landscape. So the next uh, species I wanna hit on, ecosystem I wanna hit on is our shortleaf pine. Um, this is another, another species of concern. Um, we did a lot of cutting, especially in our South Carolina mountains on national forest land. We cut our, short, our native shortleaf pine in the late 70s, early 80s to plant loblolly pine, which isn't native to our mountains, but it's a fast grower. And at that time, the, the Forest Service saw timber as, as something that was important. Well, now we're in the middle of a large project where we are currently cutting out all of that loblolly and replanting it all to shortleaf pine, that native pine to get back to, um, to what should be here. So not just in the South Carolina mountains, but across the Southern Blue Ridge and across the East, really, there's an initiative called the Shortleaf Pine Initiative. And that initiative is very much like the Longleaf Pine Initiative on our coastal plain that started, gosh, probably 30 years or more ago with uh, how do we restore our longleaf pine and, and with fire. So now we're kind of in that same boat with shortleaf pine. How do we restore this native mountain pine with fire? We know this, this species loves fire. It's got thick bark. Uh, it's a rapid sprouter. It disseminates large amounts of seeds. Um, that thick bark makes it resistant or resilient to fire. And, um, and really just these big, beautiful stately, um, these stately shortleaf pine trees that are um, bringing some, some really unique bird species and, and other uh, herbaceous plant species. And then the other one I wanna hit on that we burn for in the South Carolina mountains is the smooth cane flyer, flower. So this is uh, in the same family as the purple cane flower that is cultivated 
that you all I'm sure are aware of. Uh, this is a native to, to Oconee County. And in fact, it's on the endangered species list, but the largest population in, the, in Oconee County, or one of the largest populations in Oconee County. Um, we burn on a regular basis these areas so that we can um, cultivate or to propagate, help this, this species propagate seeds. Um, kind of like our Table Mountain Pine, they, they need that forest floor prepared so that those seeds can germinate. And um, we actually did a study on disturbance with the smooth cane flower and, and really discovered that it loves any kind of disturbance. It we, we had plots where we stomped on them and there were plots where we burned them and, and cut and um, really they responded well to, to a lot of different um, disturbance. We see them very, very often in road cuts. So disturbance once again. Um, we'll, it's, in fact, several of the areas we burn are just down to forest service roads and road banks where they really, uh, they do very well. Um, we even have some Table Mountain pine stands that have beautiful understory with smooth cane flower in it because they're living there together in that fire dependent uh, ecosystem. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit to, to wildlife benefits. Um, we burn for wildlife and probably the number one question I get from folks is, is oh my gosh, you're burning, what about the wildlife? And so that's why I like to include this picture uh, in the top here of the, the um, elk standing in the river. This picture was taken by a wildland firefighter in Idaho, I think the late 90s or early 2000s. And it's just a really good example of, um, of what wildlife does during wildfire, but during prescribed fire, we see the same, they have that same instinct. So I want to hit on a really unique uh, opportunity we had in Gatlinburg after the Gatlinburg fire in 2016. In the bottom right here, you see uh, a black bear in the University of Tennessee has a long-standing study with collared black bears in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So after the 2016 wildfire, uh, they decided, wow, wouldn't it be great to overlay our bear data with our, with our fire data? And so they overlaid those two GIS systems to just to just kind of take a look at what the bears did during the wildfire. That's a very rare opportunity. Not often do we have a wildfire that has an established group of wildlife within it that is collared and has been studied and followed for a number of years. So one, uh, there were over 20 bears in the area of, in the footprint of the fire and one of those bears was lost uh, to, to burn injuries, but the rest survived. And what we, they discovered at University of Tennessee is that those bears never left the burn footprint. They stayed in their home range. They just kind of avoided the fire and um, they knew how to get in low spots and cool spots and creeks. And then, um, and even more interesting, that winter, they didn't leave the burn area when all of their cover was gone. They just dug new dens and nestled in behind big big root mounds where trees had fallen over and and overwintered there in in the Gatlinburg fire. Um, we've even done studies on a lot of studies on herps so salamanders and our frogs made a study on the American bullfrog and discovered that the American bullfrog um, during a prescribed fire would dig down under the duff and make these little these little nests and where it was moist and hang out there until the fire was gone and when the fire and the heat was gone they would hop back out and and be on their way so a, a lot of really great benefits to to deer and turkey as far as mast and their ability to find um, ability to find food after the fire it's very rare we have a prescribed fire and we go in the next day and not see an abundance of wildlife and they're reaping the benefits they sure love those new shoots on our, on our hardwoods that pop up after a, after a fire. And so the last thing, the last main reason we do a lot of burning is a fuels management or structure protection. So, um, you know, this is Gatlinburg here. These pictures are from Gatlinburg in 2016. So you see the side of the mountain in Gatlinburg and at the top of that picture, you see the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. There's virtually no buffer between town 
or not necessarily town, but those cabins structures and uh, in the forest itself. Uh, this is the case nationwide. So, you know, before 2016 and the wildfires we had here, folks didn't really think that wildfire could happen here the way it happens in the West. But we certainly saw that in 2016. And uh, actually there's a fire burning now, right now in Maggie Valley. So, um, so it continues to be a challenge for, for the Eastern United States. The, the main challenge is here, this is, this is what we call wildland urban interface, where our urban lands touch our wildlands. And um, the challenge here is there's one road in and there's one road out. And that's where, um, that's the pinch point. We can't, get, uh, we can't get fire engines in there to help protect structures. We can't get people out to evacuate. And it becomes, it becomes very, very challenging. So if we can manage those lands adjacent to urban areas with fire, we can reduce fuels, therefore reducing the instance, hopefully, of catastrophic wildfire that maybe we'll have a fire, but at less intensity. So this is a main piece of, a large piece of what we look at because um, the last thing situation we wanna be in is a situation where we're um, putting people in there to protect these structures, to wrap these structures, to put sprinklers on these structures. That's, that's tough stuff and that's what our wildland firefighters, myself included, did all summer this summer. So, um, so we are thinking a lot about managing our lands um, so that we have let, with fire, so that we have less catastrophic fire. So, I like to touch a little bit on the Pinnacle Mountain Fire because I tend to get a lot of questions about the Pinnacle Mountain Fire and I already mentioned it earlier. Um, the Pinnacle Mountain Fire was at Table Rock. Some people refer to it as a Table Rock Fire at Table Rock State Park. Uh, just a little over 10,000 acres burned over about a month's time in the fall of 2016. So uh, firefighters from all over the country were here to fight this fire. Um, X marks the spot. So I don't know if you guys can see the X here. That's where the fire started and that was start, it was started from an, an abandoned campfire. So it, someone camped there and didn't put out their coals. And um, this fire moved very quickly, led to, to three separate evacuations of these communities that you see to the east and the south here. Um, we tried very hard to stop this fire at the creek, which is this area between the two large blocks here. And we thought we had caught it. Um, we did some, some burning here in the northern part to blacken this in. We knew the fire was moving north. If we could blacken this in and get rid of the fuels, we could stop the fire. And that was the goal. That was all fine and good until a dead hemlock that caught fire fell over the creek. And when it fell over the creek here, it caught the northern end of the fire, uh, the, this territory on fire, and it, it burned for multiple days, more days. Um, so the interesting thing here is the land ownership. So I'm gonna go back to our prescribed fire programs and what it looks like in a wildfire situation. So we have this really great fire learning network where we're all connecting and we're all doing a lot of really good burning and then we get a wildfire and we had never all fought fire together. We had just lit fire together. So here we have, um, we have the Table Rock Reservoir, Greenville Water here, um, really important. They, they have an asset to protect award-winning water. Um, we have state parks, we have North Carolina Forest Service across the state line engaged, uh, who also is a part of our fire learning network. We have Joe Cassie Gorges. We have all of these land managers in here and we go in there to try to draw a box around this wildfire and figure out where we're going to stop it. And because there are active prescribed fire programs in this area, we can use roads and we can use existing fire lines that we use for prescribed fires to kind of rein this thing in, or, or in some cases, let it burn a little bigger to an established road or an established line instead of putting an unnecessary dozer line through the woods. So there was a lot of dozer line that we had to put in here and this hashed line that you see here is all dozer line. 
But if we can avoid dozer line and allow a fire to do some good work, even though it's a wildfire, then that's that we can we can make that work and keep people safe and um, and protect areas uh, and keep the dozers out of there. But sometimes it's un inevitable, so it just um, so it just depends. But so this is kind of you know this is what it looks like for us to fight fire together in the South Carolina mountains. And um, so I like to show this video. It's just a neat perspective. A lot of people don't get to see what a fire looks like from the air. So this is the helicopter that was lighting the northern end of the, of the area and doing the back burning so that we could stop the fire. We use a, a, a ball that looks like a ping pong ball with potassium manganate in it. And there's a machine that it injects antifreeze into that ball and those balls drop out of the helicopter. And by the time they hit the forest floor, they have started a small fire. So this is kind of what it looks like from here. So we use this tool not only in wildfire situations, but we use this tool also in prescribed fires. We can very much control the heat and the intensity of a fire based on the pattern in which we put these balls out of the helicopter onto the ground. Uh, just another good series of photographs from the Pinnacle Mountain Fire. Um, the middle one there, you can see that that's a South Carolina National Guard helicopter with bucket drops. Uh, a lot of those bucket drops of water came from that Table Rock Reservoir, Greenville Water, as well as Lake Jocassi. And then um, a night burning operation by hand at the top. So not only did we do some by, by um, helicopter, but we also did uh, quite a bit by hand. And then just the bottom picture shows um, what the fire looked like when it was very active. And that was a, a shot from Highway 11. So we had the Pinnacle Mountain Fire and we get together as a fire learning network like we always do and we talk about, all right, where do we go from here? Do we just stop it and say, hey, we've had a wildfire and that's it? Well, no, I mean, we have this opportunity to do some really neat things, some new research. We have an opportunity to educate the public, um, an opportunity to make South Carolina mountain communities FireWise. FireWise is a great nationwide program that teaches homeowners how to to um, clear out around their homes and best practices to keep homes safe during wildfire situations. And that program is overseen by the South Carolina Forestry Commission. So some of that reaching the public piece came through this really neat idea called the Fire Learning Trail. So Table Rock State Park now has a Fire Learning Trail, which is a series of signs. And along with those signs is a series of podcasts. And those podcasts talk about fire. They talk to fire managers. They talk to wildland firefighters about, um, about he, in this case, at Table Rock about um, the Pinnacle Mountain Fire and about prescribed fire programs. We now have a number of fire learning trails across the Southern Blue Ridge in different areas. And each one is a little different depending on the location. Um, you know, the, the Pinnacle Mountain Fire gave us an opportunity to talk to the public a lot about the benefits of fire. And these are some of just the really neat share lines that came out of the media. The bears are back, the deer are back, everything's back and they're thriving. Um, people forget that wildfire is natural. It's nature's way of clearing out the old undergrowth and making room for the new. Uh, we're looking at an out of whack environment. I, I mentioned that earlier that our ecosystems are out of whack because of lack of fire. So how can we, um, how can these lands benefit from this wildfire? Um, and, in, and in Table Rock, in this case of the Pinnacle Mountain Fire, this fire in many places was very low intensity and did, did a lot of work um, that, that a prescribed fire or a controlled fire would do. Uh, Clemson University has had the opportunity to do some really neat research in the area of the wildfire. This is some research for Greenville Water. 
Greenville Water wants to, as you saw on my press, past, present, and future earlier, they really want to put more fire on their lands because they experienced fire on their lands through the Pinnacle Mountain fire, but they're concerned about their asset, you know, this big asset, these lakes that they've got to keep clean. And um, so you know, Don Hagen at Clemson University is working through uh, water quality in reservoirs after fire. And what they're discovering is there's no negative impacts of, um, on water quality after the wildfire. And um, that and other research has kind of, has spurred and guided really Greenville Water in moving forward with more burning on their lands. And these are just a few pictures from, um, that I like to share from the Pinnacle Mountain Fire because this is just a month well, this is January. So this fire wrapped up just before Thanksgiving of 2016, and this was January of 2017 and a hike we did out there. So much of this area benefited from the wildfire because it was very low intensity and um, very little bare mineral exposed soil out there. There is some, but uh, when you look over the landscape, the majority of it uh, still has a nice duff layer left and um, you can see the, the, there were already, there was even leaves that fell after the fire. And so there's even some litter on the forest floor. This is an example of some of the duff reduction that we saw on our forest floor in the Pinnacle Mountain Fire. We know that in a lot of places in the Southern Blue Ridge, there's this extraordinary buildup of duff that causes fire when it comes through now to have a longer residence time at the base and the roots of the tree, which naturally wouldn't have happened with more frequent fire. So this is another reason to go in and do controlled fire at a lower intensity to reduce that duff over time. So that if we do have a wildfire, we have less overstory mortality but due to that long heat and residence time setting on the roots and the the lower portion of these, um, of our hardwoods that are out there. Um, you know, the Pinnacle Mountain Fire also allowed us an opportunity to put in some photo points. And so these photo points, I, I had the privilege actually of visiting these photo points within Table, Mount, Table Rock State Park once a week for a year. And we put these together in a time lapse. And um, this is just an example of one uh, springtime after the fire, um, you can see on the ridge tops there to the right of the clouds, a little bit of, of brown, but for the most part, we had a, a very lush green resurgence of our trees and, uh, and it was beautiful. So we were able to put together this great time lapse of, of black all the way to green to the beautiful colors back to snow. Um, so like I said, I had this, this great, guaranteed once a week hike that I got paid to do, right, to go to these photo points and take photographs. And these are just some of the great wildflowers I got to see along the way. These are all in burned areas along the trail um, through Table Rock State Park. And um, yeah, it was just a joy to, to get to experience every season. And not only that, a, a walking stick on a charred log there and um, a lot of great native plants coming up amongst the burn logs and and um, and just just really cool stuff. All right, so I'll hit just a minute on the consortium of Appalachia, Appalachian fire managers and scientists. So this organization works in tandem with the Fire Learning Network, and our mission with the consortium is to facilitate facilitate this flow of information about fire science and research needs among our fire managers and our fire scientists in the Appalachian region. What we discovered is that our scientists were doing science over here and our managers are managing over here and nobody was talking. So uh, the FLN helped facilitate that conversation and then our mission is to bring that science in and I mentioned earlier how Greenville Water is using really good science to make decisions on the ground and they're doing that through um, assistance through the consortium in that in that sharing of information. Um, this is so the consortium of Appalachian fire managers and scientists is part of the fire science exchange network and this is a joint fire science program. It's funded by the US Forest Service and the Department of Interior. And this is what it looks like at the national level. So I get to work the Appalachian region, but there are regions all over the country. 
and each region has its own flavor, really. We have our own challenges with fire. We have our own needs with fire. So we're able to get out there on the ground through a lot of field trips, through fire learning trails, um, through synthesis of science, and, and really put that science to work. Um, our land managers won't, our scientists will write science and it goes in a referee journal, the Journal of Forestry. Well, our land managers self-admittedly won't pick up a journal and read it. They just don't have time and, uh, and they don't enjoy it. So we, t we take all of that science and synthesize it down into a more digestible format. AppalachianFire.org is our website. A lot of, a lot of it goes there through, um, through research briefs, through publications, um, through podcasts, through webinars through workshop videos, just all kinds of information there that folks can hop on here and they can, they can dive deeper into a topic of science, but it's, but it's digestible and it's usable in the management format. Uh, the Fire Learning Trail, that was one way, I've already mentioned that, the one we have at Table Rock, but that's been a really great success and not only reaching our, science, our land managers, but also in reaching the public, which sometimes is just as important as, as the managers and the scientists. Um, we do things like this. This is a, a publication we put together, a fire history of the Appalachian region. So we, we have a lot of really great dendrochronology work. So tree ring work, we can look at a tree, a cross section of a tree and we can see fire scars. We can date fires back through history and recreate what fire history could have been on mountaintops and across the landscape and taking all of that and putting it into a, a guide that has lots of graphs and and lots of pictures and something that our land managers pick up off the shelf and use to write write plans that they use to write NEPA if you're with a federal agency um, really valuable stuff so we get the opportunity to to really like I said put the science to work and then the last thing we get to do, which is really exciting, is to bring up the next generation in FIRE. Um, all of these students, the FIRE Tigers program, are, are most all of them are forestry, um, environmental and natural resources, wildlife majors. They have this inherent desire to work in the outdoors. So we kind of fill in with the FIRE piece. And um, right now we have 26 members, members um, mostly freshmen and sophomore. We like to start them as freshmen and sophomores in their initial training and walk them through the program through their whole undergraduate degree. Uh, and it is an official Clemson University class. And um, we have a lot of great fun. We get these students out on fires. Three of my students were out west this summer working on engines with the US Forest Service and wildland fire. Um, so a lot of really great hands-on work and um, one of the most important things, though, that we te teach these students how to do is to use science from the start to make land management decisions. That no more can we go out and just burn where we want to burn, or nor do we need to be doing it that way. That we need to be making sure that we're putting the right fire on the ground in the right place for the right reasons, that we're not just burning to burn. And that's it, y'all. This is just my contact information. Um, the website, like I mentioned, AppalachianFire.org. Um, we do have a Twitter feed and there's a Facebook page, um, which is Consortium of Appalachian Fire Managers and Scientists. And then there's my Forest Service email and my consortium email. So please, um, you know, I've got time to answer questions tonight. And then if, if I don't answer questions or if you have requests for some publications or more information, please don't hesitate to reach out um, and, and I can provide that information. Thanks so much, Helen. That was wonderful. That was a great talk. I appreciate that. Um, sure. And I think um, Dan was keeping track of any questions that um, people were um, writing in the chat. So. Okay. Get over to Dan. Um, so I had a question about uh, how is South Carolina different from uh, California besides the uh, being drier and why do they have more and worse fires than us? And, and uh, it was a question went on to say, is it really 
uh, climate change that's making it drier and hotter or? Yeah, so that's a great question. I get that question. You know, that's, it's a topic we hear a lot on the news right now. And I think what we hear on the news is either we hear the climate change or the poor management. There are two, two very different sides of the, of, the, of, the, of the issue that we hear. And it's not often that we hear someone talk about the combination of those things. It's lack of fire over the last hundred years, or lack of um, letting fire burn, or so lack of fire. So doing a good job of putting those fires out. We should have let fire burn where it needs to burn naturally. A lot of our Western fires are lightning starts. Um, so a natural part of the ecosystem. And so part of that is these species, Western species that ha are just dog hair thick that haven't been managed properly. Um, some of that is lack of funding. Some of that is the desire to, to cut these timber species, but the challenge is to do that with environmental groups that oppose some of that cutting. Um, and then our forests are drier. Um, we do, we, in my career, the amount of fire and the severity of fire has increased dramatically every year. Um, you know, we, we do in California get these, these um, winds off the coast and these major wind events that really, really push fire. The things that drive fire are low humidity, low moisture, and high winds and really and this week is a prime example of we'll have some of that weather here in our part of the world um, a lot of our california forests are um our, our lodge pole and our ponderosa pines and in the western forest where the pine forest typically is drier than a lot of our hardwood forests so we in a lot of ways have a lot more moisture with all of those lush green hardwoods that we have that some of those ecosystems in the West don't see, they're inherently just a drier ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, have you handled uh, potential conflicts with recreationists or like hikers and campers where in areas where control burns occur? You know, we work really hard to, to notify, uh, to on the Forest Service side, State Park side, anywhere where we've got a heavy recreation use, um, we, will, we will hang signs, hang notifications uh, a day or two ahead of time. Um, we will clear campgrounds and notify those staying in campgrounds. Um, we'll always, we'll even like, a couple years ago, a portion of the Foothills Trail ran through our burn unit that day. We had a sign at either end of the, of the trail and then we hiked it that morning to make sure it was clear. So um, I wouldn't say we've, we have conflicts. Um, it's just that we try to manage it the best we can and, and try to educate and try to help folks understand that, that, um, that what we're doing is for the good of the ecosystem. Now we did have a group um, of nine hikers several years ago disobey the sign and walk into the burn unit. And that was a really hairy moment and very, very scary. Um, but it all turned out okay. Um, so, you know, we even do take the time now to be more diligent about posting people at certain locations um, to make sure there are people there to intercept folks who maybe would risk entering or, or may choose not to. This area was very well flagged and very well signed and they chose to enter it anyway. So having, having folks there to intercept and explain and, and educate really um, makes a difference too. Thanks. Uh, you talked about uh, the uh, shortleaf pine being the native upstate pine and, and removing some U.S. Forest Service, removing some loblollies to, to plant. Uh, shortly, if I, I have recently seen them uh, notifying about removing white pine stands, uh, which are more mountain species, is are, is that the plan to plant shortleaf in in their place as well? Yeah, there is a plan to plant shortleaf. You know, our white pine with 
our white pine is a more, it's a species that grows on very moist sites. And we see that white pine without fire moving onto our drier sites where we would naturally see our short leaf and our table mountain and our pitch pines. So those sites that are drier, um, where they are cutting some of that white pine, they're gonna plant all that back to, to short leaf as well as table mountain pitch pine. You know, initially that loblolly was planted for timber reasons. Um, it's funny, we're in a place now where we're not planting any pine trees for timber reasons. We're, we're planting them for ecological reasons. Um, short leaf is a very, very slow growing pine tree. So to plant it in, um, you know, not to say that it won't ever be cut and thinned um, because there will maybe be a time when it, it does reach that point, but it's gonna be, you know, 70 or 80 years down the road. And so really much, a lot of this drive through the Sortley Pine Initiative and working with different landowners all over the Southern Blue Ridge is to reestablish this pine and to, especially on these drier sites where pine was native. And, um, and then trying to plant, like I said, some, some, um, some Table Mountain pitch pine ridges some of those really uh, steep south facing areas where sometimes that's kind of the only thing that can hold the soil together. It's so rocky. You mentioned uh, the pitch pine and the table mountain pine. Uh, I guess in the pond pine is the uh, Pinus serotin, I believe it is probably uh, more Piedmont and coastal plains, but I, Obviously, it depends upon fire as well, right? It does, but you're right. It is a more a more coastal plain and uh, in Piedmont pine. And uh, really, the lowest elevation we see Table Mountain and Pitch Pine communities is about 2,500 feet. So we've got a, a few spots on the Andrew Pickens, and then that's the lowest elevation that really we'll see it, and then it goes on up from there. Okay. I was going to ask about what cool plants you see after after fire, but you did have a slide on that. So any others that you didn't have in your presentation that you remember? Um, yeah, well, gosh, just, uh, and I'm not, I'm not a native, I'm not a, you guys are probably way more experts in herbaceous plants than I am. Um, being a forester, I'm, I'm sometimes more in tune with the trees than I am with, with the, the small plants on the ground. Um, so yeah, you know, we see a lot of, um, a lot of great native wildflowers and I, I scrolled back to these so that you guys could see those again. These were all very common after the fire. And then, um, but you know, one thing we are concerned about in our fire management strategies isn't the native plants, but it's the invasives. And um, we are seeing in some cases where we've got invasives um, in certain places moving in. So we are taking close, close note of that and following that. And even in some places going in and eradicating those, um, those invasives. And so, you know, it's interesting. We we always go back to this this out of whack piece, and we try to we're trying to use fire to to do to do good, and then and then maybe we might you know bring in a a, a non native or invasive. But typically, what we find is with most invasive species, if you continue to burn with a some sort of burn program every three or five or seven years, then those species tend not to make it over the long term. Um, you know, an interesting, an interesting story about um, response, plant response to fire is our mountain laurel and our rhododendron. Um, a species that we see, as you all know, in our, in our, you know, stream banks and very low areas and those species are now creeping up into our very dry areas. In fact, even on these dry ridges under our table mountain and pitch pine. And then these species have a volatile oil in the, um, 
in the leaves. And so that volatile oil is very, very explosive. So these table or these mountain laurel and rhododendron that have moved into dry sites then become a ladder fuel. And so this ladder fuel when a fire comes through, especially a wildfire, that these mountain laurels especially will just blow up and then catch the crowns of the trees on fire. So it's interesting how all these plants work together and how they're moving out of a wet area to a dry area and then that has a negative impact on the ecosystem when you try, you know, when you get a wildfire in there because, because how it responds to fire is different than historically how it responded in its native, on its native site. So, um, you know, there's always something to learn out there. We know so little probably compared to, to, um, to what's out there. But I think the important thing is, is that we, all of us who are putting fire on the ground have this just, this great desire to do right by, by our Southern pine, our Southern ecosystem, or, you know, um, Southern Blue Ridge ecosystems. And we all have a passion for it and we all um, love the land and we hike it like you guys do and we we live in it like you guys do and we want to do our very best to take care of it and so um yeah we just all are really driven in, in a lot of ways by these plants and how how they react in different sites and how that integrates with fire and and there are a lot of unanswered questions still but um but i think the passion to do it and to do it do the research and to integrate that research into our management is definitely there. So that was a long way around. I didn't give you any specific flowers there. Well, thank Dan. you I'm for sorry. your, uh, your, your <laughs> science background and you're applying all that to making this a better place. Uh, I think that's all the questions that I, I have seen so far. Thank you. Thank all you, right. Ellen. Thanks. Yeah, so much, thank you. Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. We could hear the passion in your voice, and <laughs> and um, and it was it was great um, how you explained everything to us to help us better understand all that you're doing um, to protect the ecosystems. It's wonderful. Yeah, you know, I think it's more complex than we see. We we very commonly see snippets on the news now of of different pieces because we see these catastrophic wildfires, especially out west. But it's, um, it's not often that the average person gets to really see all those pieces working together and how they fit together and, and how sometimes they don't fit together and how we're working to still fit some of those things together, that it's a work in progress. And um, yeah, but it's, I'm thankful to, to have had my time in fire and to continue to, to use fire in a good way. And um, yeah, and, and I'd love even as big as putting a, putting fire on the ground with a drip torch, I love just as much to share it with you guys and, and educate and, and answer questions. And sometimes say, I don't know that we're still figuring it all out. Uh, Helen, I used to spend a lot of time with Cecil Frost, a fireman. 